All right. So, hello back, and thank you for um, for giving us the opportunity to present our experiences. Um, so today we'll talk about uh, our experiences with mach a mach a centralized machine learning service uh, at CERN and using Kubeflow, and uh, how we'll, we've been changing it to to make it better for our users. Um, my name is Ricardo Rocha. I'm a computing engineer in the CERN cloud team. I do a lot of containerized uh, work, networking, and some machine learning as well. I also am in the, a member of the CNCF Technical Oversight Committee, and I co-lead the research and user group also of the CNCF. Uh, hello. Uh, glad to be here. My name is Dan. Uh, I'm a software engineer at uh, CERN Cloud team. Uh, I work on containers and machine learning and Kubeflow, and uh, I will uh, start with some introduction about our project, and then Ricardo will discuss uh, things in, in more depth. Uh, so, we work at CERN. Uh, CERN is a research organization for particle physics in Geneva, Switzerland, and it's operating the largest particle physics laboratory in the world. Uh, the mission of CERN is to find the origins of the universe, to answer the fundamental questions such as what is the universe made of, and to understand how particles behave at the smallest scales. Uh, so, to understand how particles behave at the smallest scales, we need to use very high energies. So, to do that, we build part particle accelerators, and LHC is the biggest particle accelerator in the world. So, it's a 27 kilometers ring of superconducting magnets that uh, runs 100 meter underground in Geneva. Uh, and uh, in that magnet, uh, particles are accelerated near the speed of light and then they're collided at four different points, four collision points. So after particles collide at uh, these high energies, uh, physicists gather results using detectors or experiments, and then they uh, use this data to get uh, valuable uh, insights into the, into the science of the smallest scale particles. So we can see how uh, magnets look like live. Uh, and this is one of the detectors. We can see people here and how, uh, we, how this structure looks like. And uh, this is essentially electronics to uh, extract data from the collisions. So how do we use machine learning at, at CERN? Uh, so uh, the data acquisition system works that uh, works in a specific way. So uh, there are 40 million collisions that happen uh, every second, basically, at the LHC. Uh, but computing infrastructure can only sustain 1,000 uh, events per second. So we need to somehow go from 40 million to 1,000. 1, and to do that, we use a trigger mechanism. So essentially, those are uh, algorithms that select interesting events to, to save and to further process. Um, so to which the, the question is what is interesting and how these uh, interesting events are selected. And to do that, we can either use deterministic algorithms or we can use uh, uh, machine learning algorithms. And uh, for that, we would use uh, supervised machine learning algorithms uh, that can either run in L1 trigger or, not, or at high level trigger uh, to select the interesting events. And this, this works quite well if we know what we are looking for. But the question is, what if we are looking for, for some new physics? So, so far, uh, machine learning has been uh, used extensively at CERN. For example, to find, uh, to prove the existence of Higgs boson, uh, boosted decision trees were used uh, quite, quite a lot. Uh, but uh, there are other physics theories that were not confirmed by LHC data, which uh, uh, were expected to be confirmed. For example, supersymmetry or ex extra dimensions. Uh, so that hasn't been found in LHC data yet. So the question is, what if uh, uh, our signal hypothesis for trigger algorithms was wrong? So what, uh, what if there was some kind of bias in supervised learning? So this calls for some unsupervised learning, some algorithms that could actually learn during online processing, uh, that could uh, train on uh, experiment data, not only on uh, simulations. 
So besides uh, these uh, high-level overviews of machine learning, there are, other, there are multiple groups at CERN that work on machine learning, and uh, they all have their own local infrastructure. So our motivation is to provide a centralized infrastructure where users can actually use uh, GPUs and FPGAs and TPUs, and they can, that they can have a user-friendly platform to run their workloads. So uh, this is our motivation for Kubeflow, to develop a centralized platform that can be used by, by different groups, and we have been working on that for, for a bit. Uh, the idea is to uh, provide a, f a full uh, machine learning lifecycle with Kubeflow uh, to get data from detectors, to perform data preparation, to run some uh, fast iteration jobs such as notebooks, and to validate uh, machine learning models. And then once we're happy with our models to do distributed training and model validation um, and uh, actually train our models and then uh, to store the models and use them for serving for inference and production. And with Kubeflow, we can do all of that. And this is why we're using it. So we started with a single user. Um, Kubeflow 1.0. Uh, at this point, we were exploring uh, available features, making sure that pipelines work, that cutip jobs work, and that uh, uh, we can run our machine learning workloads. Uh, so this was the initial stage. Then we moved to 1.1 instance with a multi-user, and we integrated that with other CERN services. We integrated that with a single sign-on, with uh, uh, we were managing that with Argo CD, and we have onboarded the uh, users at that point. So we are, we are at that point still working closely with users to gather their feedback, to uh, discuss uh, uh, things, to provide support more closely. And uh, we were discussing the previous KubeCon in more detail, the, our bursting to public cloud. Uh, and currently we are working with uh, 1.3 instance where our focus is on security. Uh, we want to provide credential management and namespace management and uh, uh, vulnerability scans for uh, Docker images, and then also some runtime checks. Uh, the idea is to provide general availability of the service to uh, be able to open it to thousands of people who, who work at CERN. And this is our, our idea. And Ricardo will take over. Thank you. Uh, I'll actually build on this one. So uh, this this diagram really shows the evolution of the service at CERN. Uh, we got to the point where we could scale to the to the size and the, number, the amount of resources that our users needed. Uh, but um, then when, before opening it in production, there were a couple of things that we, we had to focus on. Uh, and this is the list that we see here in the 1.3. And this is the requirements we had before making it uh, generally available uh, on-premises. So the things uh, I'll be covering here, uh, in addition to the resource availability, I'll cover uh, the management of credentials for the users, uh, some uh, like decoration of namespaces with user metadata, uh, the scans and, and checks for, for the images, and then using things like OPA for policy informant, e enforcement and runtime checks of the workload. So th these are really requirements that we have that are not only for a machine learning service, but they're quite quite important if you're having a like multi-tenant, multi-user uh, deployment. But the first thing I will cover is uh, regarding resource usage. So um, Dan introduced that one of the motivations we had was to kind of Im improve the efficiency of the, the resources we have at CERN. Instead of having multiple groups, uh, having each, each of the groups, uh, several GPUs, we wanted to have like a central uh, pool of resources uh, that would make it uh, more efficient overall. So we, get, we have an example here where, where we have uh, different groups uh, at CERN, say CMS and Atlas, which are uh, experiments at CERN. So Atlas, SUSE is supersymmetry. Uh, we had also gr groups in IT doing anomaly detection or in beam calibration doing reinforced learning uh, while they calibrate uh, the LHC beams. Uh, all of this is kind of inefficient because each of the groups has to maintain their own GPUs and also the resource usage is restricted to these individual groups. So moving to something like this, uh, where uh, we basically have a single entry point for everyone to come, 
and 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 then benefit from these GPUs uh, is 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 a big improvement for us. Also, we can integrate things like FPGAs and other accelerators as as required. It does pose some challenges because you suddenly start uh, sharing the resources between users. Uh, the other thing we wanted to, to do, is, which uh, Dan also mentioned and we presented last KubeCon, is we want to scale out. Like the, the amount of resources we have on-premises are actually not enough for what we need uh, in terms of accelerators. Uh, both in terms of GPUs, we don't have enough, but also accessing specialized accelerators like TPUs, uh, which we'll probably not never have, and they are restricted to, to the cloud providers or IPUs in the case of Azure, TPUs for GCP. So we want to abstract all of this so that our users don't have to understand the infrastructure, they just have to run their workloads. Um, the other part, um, um, so here it, it's, where, where the integration starts, um, uh, we, we, we rely on Kubeflow, as, as we mentioned, but then if we have this big pool of resources, we might have, say, NVIDIA P100s and NVIDIA 100s uh, S, which are quite good at double precision, very good for distributed training um, when you're doing things like uh, deep learning. Um, and we expose this via PCI pass-through. We also have NVIDIA T4s, which we use for notebooks, training, and, and inference, again, using PCI pass-through. But then, um, if you're just using a notebook for validating your model with a small small amount of data, you probably don't need a full GPU. So we started looking at this idea of uh, doing virtual GPUs, and the previous talk was, was talking about sharing uh, resources for model serving. Uh, this is similar, uh, similar concept. And then also we started looking at adding NVIDIA A100s, they will arrive soon. And here we can actually do physical partitioning instead of just uh, time sharing uh, as with the T4s and VGPUs. So we wanted to expose this to our users uh, when they spawn a um, uh, notebook at CERN. So they won't see just like, uh, I want a GPU NVIDIA, they will actually have like a drop down box that says, I want an, uh, uh, like a full GPU or I want a, vir a virtual GPU. And here I would highlight what we are aiming for, and we'll come back to this, is uh, when you see their uh, GPUs available to use, no, we want to express to the user actually what is the availability of resources so that they don't just try uh, senselessly to, to get a resource that is not there. Um, and again, we, we want to integrate the public cloud resources uh, into the same, same setup. So we are like halfway there, I would say. The other part, which is, uh, yeah, I mentioned I mentioned the A100. So if you've played with the NVIDIA T4s, you know, like you can virtualize these GPUs or V100s uh, with this time sharing, which is kind of virt uh, like a fake uh, partitioning. You're not actually partitioning the resources. Uh, but with A100s, there's this multi-instance GPU support, which is really exciting because it gives us a lot more flexibility on how to partition resources uh, to the end users without having to, to like, do any compromise in terms of uh, um, the expected quality of service. And then really building on the previous talk, I would, I would uh, complement uh, uh, the things we are doing. So I mentioned NVIDIA virtual GPUs with uh, time, times for time sharing. Uh, there, there were, uh, I will just put a note here, if you're using this, one thing we learned is that uh, this was not uh, really suitable for all our users because the, the ones that need GPU profiling or want to use a TensorBoard or something similar, they actually require uh, the profiling to be enabled on the GPUs. This was a limitation with the, the 12 uh, drivers, the version 12 drivers of NVIDIA. Uh, this is actually fixed in version 13, we've tested this, so we, we actually are about to deploy this to our users. This will make uh, the use of our T4s uh, much better. But again, the, the next step is what we are getting early next year, which is this new NVIDIA A100s, where we can do up to seven times physical partitioning. And this is something that is uh, supported directly on Kubernetes. Uh, the NVIDIA drivers are able to, do, to manage MIG, uh, MIG uh, cards. So this, this is really great because the VGPUs were, are, are not something that Kubernetes uh, handles uh, natively. Um, yeah. And then the other part is the multimodal serving. This is also a, a requirement we have to make the best out of the GPU is to be able to split, to, to reuse the same, same GPU for serving multiple models. And this is uh, something with, like, this is a very basic example where you basically create a single inference service 
and then uh, you have one or more uh, actual models that are linked to that inference service. So this is something that we also try to do, and it's uh, it's, it's uh, like a follow up to the to the really good previous talk. So the second part I would, I would mention is this uh, this requirement we have to integrate with our on-premises resources. Uh, so we rely on mutating uh, mission webhooks for, for all of this. Uh, we are actually using the OPA gatekeeper. Um, in, if you've deployed Kubeflow, you know that uh, you can do a lot with customize in terms of changing the, the YAML uh, that is being used for the deployment, but this is not enough. Um, one example is, for example, the notebook template to customize the, the notebooks in the Jupyter web app. Uh, it's quite limited on what you can do this if you want to like change the template dynamically based on some uh, runtime information, you can't do this with customize. So we do this with, with uh, mutating webhooks. Uh, this is used already in different parts of Kubeflow. I'll give some examples um, and then I'll go a bit deeper. Um, one thing, if you want to, for example, to start a pod, speed notebooks or pipeline jobs uh, uh, with the proper UID, GID of the local users for multiple reasons, uh, uh, we, we do this change at runtime. Uh, another thing is that we need to manage the credentials for the users so that they can access like storage systems or, or any kind of other internal system. Uh, we inject those credentials also at, run, uh, at uh, deployment time of the pods, creation time. Um, yeah, the volume mounts for, for internal storage systems as well. So this is uh, an example for the credential management. Uh, I would say mostly we have two types of um, uh, credentials that we have to handle. The first one is Kerberos, the second one is OAuth2. Um, most of our services uh, require one or the other or both. Um, so the, in both cases, they are short-lived, which means like uh, you might have a credential, you, you spawn your, your training, but it takes hours, they will expire. So what we've done, we've written a small tool that actually manages the credential renewal for the users uh, uh, transparently. So when, when they, they basically get a notebook, they will upload, say, a Kerberos credential to their namespace. Um, and then the, the tool will know how to handle this and keep the credentials up to date. So if they then submit a pipeline, uh, a training job, uh, or any kind of other workload on the cluster, uh, the, the mounts of these secrets will actually make the credentials available for, for the workloads to use. And this is true both for uh, OAuth2 and, and Kerbus. And you can see here like a diagram. The first step is for a user to like push the credentials into a secret and our job will renew them. And then the actual workloads have this mutating webhook that is actually uh, mounting these secrets and making them available so that they can access things like storage or the internal Spark clusters, uh, the batch cluster, which is based on HD Condor, the registry to upload their models, things like this. The second part is what I mentioned that uh, we sometimes have to annotate workloads with the metadata of, uh, of the user. So an example is, is again, notebooks have to have a UID, GID that matches the actual user. So we do this uh, by actually when, when a new user is onboarded, they get the private namespace, but we have a component that will basically fetch all the metadata from say LDAP, the internal LDAP, and we'll put all of this as, as uh, annotations um, or labels in, in the namespaces of the users, and the same is true for groups. Uh, this means that we have all the metadata we need about the users to then uh, do mut mutations at, uh, at runtime when creating the pods uh, to, to deploy them with the, the appropriate uh, uh, security context, uh, all the, the proper user group that is required. This is a, like a requirement from our security team. And then the last one I, I would mention is uh, the internal registry. So all we mandate that all the workloads running on the cluster have to come from our internal registry, which means that they've, they've been through the vulnerability scans. We use Trivi for this. We also sign all the images. Uh, then we have the different policy enforcements at uh, creation time, which, for example, prevent external images from being run, uh, but also can do checks like uh, is the security context uh, 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 correct or acceptable? Or do, does the workload have all the metadata we need, like for accounting, for example? 
Uh, so we do we do have some some sort of caching and replication from Docker Docker Hub into our internal registry that then triggers all these scans and then we we go from there. Uh, the second part is that at runtime, like this, this will help us at deployment time. But if you have long running jobs, uh, we also need need to do some checks at runtime. So we are using Falco for this, and we do basically two main things. Uh, one is to see that whatever vulnerability checks were done are still valid, that there's no new vulnerability for some sort of long-running notebook, for example. And the second one is that the workloads are doing what they're expected to do. So there's no shells being spawned inside the container. There's no packages that are not supposed to be installed, uh, being, being installed, doing some weird system calls or network connections. So we do these checks live. And uh, one thing that is quite um, uh, uncommon uh, at least, uh, but I think everywhere, is that when we described this tag to our security team, they were actually very happy. And this uh, having a security team being happy about uh, new services is, uh, is not common, so this was uh, uh, quite uh, satisfying. I think that's it. Uh, so, um, uh, so far we have been working with a couple of groups at CERN who have been using uh, our Kubeflow instance. Uh, and in the next couple of slides, I'll describe some uh, individual user feedbacks. Uh, so the first one uh, the users really like is uh, the integration between notebooks to pipelines. They really enjoy using Kale. So if they can go from a notebook to a uh, to a pipeline seamlessly without writing any Docker images or anything with Kubernetes, that, that's really a big advantage for users. So this is something we have a very, very positive feedback so far. Uh, then uh, users really enjoy the ability to get resources on demand. So, uh, for example, if they have some models that need hundreds of GPUs to properly train, uh, they can't have that locally. Uh, and uh, on the public cloud, uh, we can provide access to this number of, uh, of GPUs. So users really like that and they ask for such uh, uh, abilities. Uh, and then there we have some advanced users. For example, we have a group at uh, Atlas, one of the experiments that uh, they have some, they have a repo with machine learning project. And then on that project, they have continuous integration. And uh, yeah, whenever they uh, commit, they want to run some continuous integration. Uh, they would like to add a step that would trigger a pipeline into our Kubeflow instance within their uh, CI. So they need uh, um, API access to, to Kubeflow. So this is something that we also uh, need sometimes. Uh, uh, and then um, uh, we need some uh, uh, better uh, um, UI for when uh, resources are not available. For example, for notebook creations for GPUs, um, we implemented this additional tool that tells us if we have uh, available GPUs in our system and as Ricardo was mentioning, to select uh, a, the, the profile for, for a GPU. So if users could actually automatically see if they have a GPU, it, it's much better for them. Um, so, to, to sum up, uh, Kubeflow has been very well received at CERN. Um, we are about to open to all users and all groups after we validate with the, uh, our security uh, requirements that Ricardo was discussing. Um, so, yeah, we want to provide credential and namespace management as well. And uh, for the improvements from the actual Kubeflow, it would be great if we could have a complete isolation. For example, for uh, pipelines, uh, it's already done in the back end. It would be really great for us to have that in, in front end as well. Also, pipeline uh, artifacts to be isolated. And also, we would need some better debugging of CATIP jobs because users can't see logs on the UI. And uh, yeah, maybe a better feedback uh, speaking of resource availability. But in general, uh, Kubeflow is uh, like whenever we have a presentation in CERN, people are very excited and our users so far really uh, enjoy using it. So thank you very much. And I guess if you have any questions, let us know.